Our time to talk conversation will begin in 60 seconds. Good evening and welcome everyone. We're excited you've joined us for our first time to talk conversation. My name is Corey James. I'm the Director of Diversity, Inclusion and <clears throat> Community Engagement for the Cleveland Cavaliers and Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. I just recently completed my 13th season with the organization, my first in my current role. Um, for my first 12 years, I spent it primarily working in our premium and suites teams, um, as well as our corporate partnerships for um, five years before transitioning into our diversity, inclusion, and community engagement space in April of 2019. We spent the last year or so further solidifying the foundation of the organization's commitment within the space of diversity and inclusion, which was always important, but without a team dedicated to the work. Um, that work is really centered around five different ideal aspirations, as we like to call them. And one of those aspirations is being relevant and trusted within all communities. Um, for us, in order to be relevant and trusted, relationships are key. And we're excited that one of our relationships has allowed and brought time to talk to us tonight. Before we speak about the conversation, I want to give you some background on um, exactly what All for Cleveland and more specifically All for Black Cleveland um, represents to our organization. Since the early 2000s, our DNA motto has always been All for One, One for All. Um, I previously mentioned that as a diversity and inclusion and community engagement team, um, it's important for us to be relevant and trusted in all communities. For us, that means being relevant to all of Cleveland, but more specifically, all of the individual communities that Cleveland represents, especially the black community. That said, um, our organization efforts within the black community um, fall with, under and within our All for Black Cleveland moving, movement moving forward. Um, tonight's time to talk is All for Black Cleveland, specifically black men. And while the Time to Talk series will eventually expand to different groups, um, it was born out of community needs that brought that were brought to the table by um, one of our partners in the NAACP Cleveland branch. And joining us to shed more light on um, the background of the series, as well as some information as it relates to the NAACP Cleveland branch is Madam President, um, good friend of mine, Ms. Danielle Sidnor. Thank you, Corey. Good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Sidnor, and I'm the president of the Cleveland branch of the NAACP. I just want to say thank you to the Cleveland Cavaliers, to Corey James, and to Kevin Clayton, who have been phenomenal partners with us on this series and many of the things that we've had the opportunity to engage with as a team together. I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight and really on the heels of a strong celebratory weekend where many around the country and around the world recognized Juneteenth and celebrated for the first time, and Father's Day, which helps to center a part of the reason that we're having this conversation. Unfortunately, it was not a celebratory event that really sparked the desire to have this conversation. It's as a result of what we currently see. We're living in a global pandemic and also dealing with the senseless tragedies that have happened to black men and black women all across this country. And so as a result of being a woman who has two black sons and having men in my life that I care deeply for, I asked some partners to come together to provide a platform to have a real dialogue about what our black men are facing right now. And while this session, yes, is dedicated to Black men in partnership with the Cleveland Cavaliers and Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, this will be a continued conversation about things that really are, are very pressing in the Black community, families, women, uh, identity issues, things that we need to have a platform to talk about together. And so I can't say thank you enough to the chairs who really worked behind the scenes, uh, Courtney 
and Arnold Hines, who really helped to pull this together. So please make sure you tune in, you follow all of our supporters. The NAACP Cleveland needs you now more than ever to make sure you're registered to vote and you complete your census. And I'll turn it back over to Corey. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Looking forward to continuing the work. Now, it's time to talk. Um, our Offer by Cleveland Time to Talk series powered by the NAACP Cleveland chapter will always feature distinguished guests from around the nation, whether experts, advocates, community influencers, will feature guests who are consistently leading and actively showcasing commitments um, to creating change for their communities. And tonight is no different. We have four leaders in their respective fields um, who all share a commonality as mental health advocates. Um, tonight's talk is being uh, moderated by an industry professional with over 30 years of experience in diversity and inclusion. Um, formerly the Chief Diversity Officer for Bonds of Court Mercy Health Systems. Um, this Clevelander came back home in April 2019 um, to assume a role with one of his favorite hometown sports teams. He's also the board chair of Community Health Charities, one of the largest um, health charities in the country. Um, I'm excited to call him my leader and um, he's our VP of Diversity, Inclusion and Community Engagement with the Cavaliers and Rocky Mortgage Fieldhouse, Mr. Kevin Clayton. Hey, thank you, Corey, and thank you, Danielle, as well. Hey, we got a great conversation in store this evening. And before we get started, let me just give you a few ground rules. One of which, however you're watching this conversation, you'll be able to communicate your questions through social media, and the questions will come directly to me, and I'll answer the questions or direct the questions to whomever you direct them to. So we'll have a great opportunity to have a two-way exchange. There could not be a more critical time for us to have this conversation about mental health, behavioral health, and the impact on Black men. When we think about having a, such a conversation, you know, particularly given that 63% of Black men, based on statistical information, look at having conversation like this as a sign of weakness. So the fact that you have Black men coming together to talk about this issue is really a first for me, and it's a treat for me to sit, sit back and be able to learn and hear from these good brothers as well. For us as Black men, this is probably one of the most critical times, as, as was mentioned around the impact on COVID, with COVID-19 having on our community, the constant images that we see of Black men and women continually being killed, let it be by law enforcement, let it be by individuals that are driving down the street in Brunswick, Georgia, or let it be somebody who's just sleeping in bed, like Breonna Taylor, who was killed and slain. Those images over and over again also stay true to our, our thought process. And regardless if we go to work, regardless if we go out in the streets, regardless if we're staying at home, we take that with us. And most of us don't talk about the impact that it has on us. So we're gonna have a chance to have that conversation. So let me first introduce our distinguished panel. And I'm gonna ask that our panelists just give a very brief kind of outline, not necessarily of what you do, but why is this important to you? And why, how is this conversation right now relevant to you and your daily walk? So first I wanna introduce Jeff Johnson, and he also oversees many different organizations, but he also has one that's very near and dear to his heart called Men Thrive. Jeff, welcome. Thanks so much, Kevin. And, and I, I just wanna celebrate uh, Danielle Sidnor and, and her leadership in the NAACP as a former national youth director of the NAACP. I'm, I'm super excited to see what she's doing in the city of Cleveland and appreciative to be invited uh, to this with the Cavs organization. Uh, Men Thrive is an organization that was developed to help brothers uh, show up whole, operate in joy and live with power. And that's why this is important because in this moment, as much as any other, um, imagine what the world would look like if black men showed up whole. Full stop. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'd like to introduce a, a, a good friend of mine that really has uh, educated me in this area, Archie Green, the, uh, the, the founder of an organization called Pull Them Layers Back and also Culture Junkie. Archie, welcome. And let's hear from you. 
Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I am grateful to be here. I want to also acknowledge uh, Danielle and the Cleveland NAACP, uh, Corey, Kevin, and the Cleveland Cavaliers Diversity and Inclusion Department as well. Um, I run an organization called Peel Them Layers Back. Uh, it was birthed from my lived experience being clinically diagnosed with depression in 2014. Uh, it also was birthed from a song that I wrote. I'm also a hip hop artist. Uh, and our primary mission is to culturally educate, equip, and empower uh, youth uh, and, uh, and young adults with the tools to live a mentally healthy life. We use hip hop as a vehicle to break the stigma for that. We do concerts, we do uh, uh, open mics, we, do, we take a very non-conventional approach to that. And uh, I'm grateful to be here on this panel tonight. Hey, thank you, Archie. Thank you. And last is our coach, the Cleveland Cavaliers coach, our head coach, Coach J.B. Bickerstaff. Coach, please welcome, and if you could share kind of this moment for you and having this conversation, what it means to you, please. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. Uh, you know, I appreciate the group putting this together. Uh, everybody on this panel for taking the time is extremely important. And, you know, I wanted to be a part of this conversation because, you know, what we do is work with young men. Um, again, our league is 75% uh, African-American males. Um, so having a ton of experience and conversations with those young men and trying to help them uh, not just better themselves as basketball players, but better themselves uh, as human beings. And, you know, mental health is a huge part of that. Um, you know, how can we impact others in the way that we want to impact them in a positive way if we're struggling uh, with ourselves, you know, inside and don't have the tools to solve or help uh, with what we're battling. So, um, you know, for me, uh, as a part of an organization and a part of a team, I'm just thankful uh, for the opportunity to learn more from this crew here uh, and be able to do a better job of helping the young men that I work with every day. Thank you, Coach. So before we begin the conversation, I have a special guest that I want to introduce, and that is Dr. Tony Spann. Dr. Spann is the Chief Clinical Officer out of Washington, D.C. for Henry Health. And one of the things that we thought would be helpful was to begin to walk the talk on how Black men should begin to really think about mental health, behavioral health, and those challenges. And Tony, Dr. Dr. Spann is going to walk us through uh, a brief exercise as we begin this discussion. Welcome, Dr. Spann. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, um, we're going to do a brief exercise, just about 60 seconds on how to deep breathe and actually get into a meditative space. And so for those that are listening and for the panel, the brothers that are here, um, if you'd like to close your eyes, please close your eyes. If you don't close your eyes, just listen along to me. Um, the whole intention of meditation and deep breathing is allowing for the breath to get down into the diaphragm, allowing for blood to run through the body with oxygen and allowing for you to think in a very more focused state. And so that's the whole intention of what this exercise will be, okay? So as you listen to my voice, I want you to take your first initial deep breath into your lungs to a one, two, three, and exhale into whatever space that you're in right now, if you're sitting down or if you're standing up, I want you to think about relaxing your muscles. Throughout our day, we're very tense and our muscles aren't supposed to be tense all the time. We're supposed to allow them to relax. So relax your shoulders, relax your muscles and take a deep breath in. And exhale. Remember that your life force, your value should be centered with you. You take a deep breath in and you exhale. Remember that with each breath, you realize your purpose and your value and you take a deep breath in and you exhale. Remember that breath is life and life is breath, and that there's the purpose of breathing and being of value and of purpose. You take a deep breath in, and you exhale. 
As we come to the end of this exercise, I really want you all to think about the purpose of deep breathing, the purpose of being calm and relaxed. And remember that you all have value, and that even this conversation will bring more value to you and that you will extend that same value to the community that you live in. So continue to take breaths in so that you can remember your purpose and that it's centered within you and centered within your own value. And so thank you for allowing me to share that time with you. Hey, Dr. Saman, thank you. I mean, wow, that, that had instant impact on me. So thank you, thank you. So gentlemen, it is time to talk. And because I know each one of you, I know we're gonna have a spirited, real conversation. So I'd like to ask each one of you, and I'm gonna start with you, Jeff, as I've been glued to the TV for the last four, five, six weeks, ever since Mr. Floyd was, was murdered, the images over and over and over again, just, just I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't miss it, I can't, I can't be away from it. How have the images impacted you? I mean, how, how are you dealing with the continual conversation, the images of black men and women being killed? I refuse to, conf I refuse to consume them. Um, so I have a, um, a notification that gives me headline updates so that I can get a sense of what's going on in the news without having to consume uh, somebody's story about it that normally is looking to give me an emotional response one way or the other. And so I'll be very honest with you, the, the video that got me the most is when I'm watching this young man in a parking lot in Atlanta, having a 35 minute conversation with the police before they decide that he's too much of a threat to give a ride home. And so there wasn't any violence in the video. There wasn't any shooting in the video. There was no taser in the video. There was no gun in the video. There was no nightstick in the video. And that was what was more painful for me because this was a black man that communicated a level of humanity. And at no point did the police say, let me give you a ride home. Let me get you an Uber. I'm gonna have to keep these keys and you're gonna have to come get them in the morning. There was nothing about him that gave them a desire to extend a level of humanity to him. And that was almost more painful to me than the in the moment violence because they robbed him of humanity in a situation where all he extended was humanity. And, and so for me, it's just compounded trauma. Um, it's trauma that I have experienced as long as I can remember as a black man in this country. Um, but I'll I tell you, Kev, what, what has been, uh, and, and I let some of the other brothers chime in, what's been, I think, even more painful and required a level of um, really going inward so that I focus my anger as opposed to allow it to control me is the premeditated nature of what I felt like I've seen over the last few months. Um, leaning on a brother's neck for eight minutes plus was premeditated. Um, hunting a brother down as he's jogging in a community where you know he's not doing anything wrong is premeditated. Faking an emergency in Central Park to call the police on somebody who is simply checking you about your dog is premeditated. And so, you know, previously we'd seen um, police scuffling with or um, trying to assess risk with their inhumanity or in the moment kind of decisions happening. All of these were slow and intentional. And that for me was what was most traumatic because the police can spin something when it's in the moment and they're trying to respond split second. And while they may be responding with a level of fear and inhumanity towards black folks, there's a reality of an in the moment response. When you're killing somebody over eight minutes, there's no in the moment response. When you are intentionally getting in a truck with guns and a posse going to hunt somebody down, there's no in the moment response. 
when you are intentionally faking a level of crisis in order to spark the police to come and show up and engage a black man. There's no in the moment. And so I think, I think to your question, what, what has been more painful for me than anything else is the premeditated nature of the inhumanity of white supremacy and police that I have had to navigate with my children um, as well as had to continue to come to grips with, y'all really don't see us at all. And so that has been, that has been where I think um, I've had to create a whole lot of energy in making sure my anger is focused into productive purpose um, versus uh, reactive movement. All right, so, so, so Jeff, thank you. And here's what I find interesting is that your initial comment was, you don't let it consume you, but yet you're able to recite almost every incident that happened. So think about those like myself and others that it's constant 24 seven. So Archie, I'd like for you to weigh in on that. How, how were you able to deal with the consistency of imagery of our brothers and sisters consistently being killed? I would echo what Jeff started out with. I do my best to avoid uh, consuming or limit. I limit the amount uh, of social media, news, everything. I mean, I want to obviously stay uh, up to date with the facts, with everything that's going on in the various cases. But um, to protect my sanity, my mental health, I limit the amount of that stuff that I consume. I still have not watch the video. I don't have any intentions to watch the video of George Floyd being murdered. Um, I've seen too many brothers and sisters being cut down like we're animals. Um, and what that does, what that does to the psyche of us as a people is the more we consume that, the more we start to believe subconsciously that we are, we really are who they say we are. Inferior, we're not powerful, we're not kings and queens, we're not like one of the, like the most beautiful people on this earth, you know? And so the more that I consume that, the more weak that I feel, the more inferior that I feel, the more I question my existence on this planet. And so I do my best to limit the amount um, that I ingest. And, and honestly, man, some of the stuff that we did at the beginning, these breathing exercises that we do with Dr. Span, I do breathing exercises daily. I meditate daily. Um, you know, I use various apps. Uh, Insight Timer is one uh, where sometimes I'll do anxiety focused meditations. Sometimes I actually did one recently connect, reconnecting with ancestors, you know, our ancestors to really understand their perspective and their sacrifice. I, you know, I believe that our brothers and sisters that have been cut down by the police were not only assassinated, but sacrificed for our freedom, our real freedom in this world to be treated as and looked at as equals. Um, and so I do the best to kind of, kind of a shoe, but at the same time, it's like Solange said, you can't, you know, you can't drink it away. You can't smoke it away. You can't do all these things away. It's always going to be there. Um, and so what I do to empower myself uh, is remember who I am. Remember, you know, that I'm a man of God, you know, that I'm a Morehouse man, that I'm an Omega, all these different layers of, of Archie Green, the man. Um, but I'm a king. I was born a king and no one else can define or control my narrative. Um, and I also pour into my art um, as a musician. I recently did a song, a new music video and song called All Things Mitch, which is all about the black American dream, which is being paid to be ourselves without having to put on a mask, no pun intended, without having to pretend when we're on, uh, when we're at uh, a board meeting or when we're walking down the street or whatever, to be unapologetically ourselves and to make a living doing that. And so, those are the main ways that I do my best. I also, um, I've been watching a lot of great movies. Uh, the Five Bloods is a great recommendation if you haven't seen it. Um, you know, just, just really getting in tune to what makes us beautiful as a people as opposed to what other people try, how they try to control our narrative. Yeah, thank, thank you, Archie. 
So, so coach, we've heard don't consume. We've heard take care of yourself. We've heard visualize positive images of ourselves. We've heard look internally for our strength. As you've seen these images, I also know as a as as a as a family man, as a as a father, having children, and as you're consuming this, how are you able to just kind of maintain your sanity through this process? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, there was a period of time where I consumed it all, right? I watched it. I you know I, I learned more about it. I tried to understand you know, the circumstances around each individual situation that we've been, been seeing. And I've used that now as fuel to help myself move forward. Um, you know, it's pushed me to educate myself more on history. Uh, it's pushed me to ask older people more questions. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a mother who was a teacher uh, for 20 plus years. Uh, my father was in positions of leadership for, you know, multitude of years. And, you know, I, I keep telling people, like, it wasn't that long ago. My father was born in the segregation. So it wasn't that long ago, and we're not that far from it. So as after I consumed it, and I went through, you know, the frustration, the anger, the exhaustion, and then I used it to drive myself to try to do more and help correct or solve uh, or influence some of the situations that we've seen. Uh, and, you know, again, that's been through education, that's been through the conversations that you and I've had. Uh, it's trying to figure out ways, you know, that we can combat this. Uh, and as many, you know, within our community, figuring out how we can help you know, the reasons why, you know, we keep talking about, you know, the policing obviously uh, is an issue. Um, you know, the economic and the poverty gap in our community is a huge issue, you know, as well uh, that does impact the policing. So I think there's all these things that I've been trying to learn about and study uh, and put my mind into just drive me to want to do more. And then, you know, like we mentioned before, understanding and explaining it to my kids. Right. And who I have to be so that my kids can understand and see something uh, and move them to want to do things in a positive way as they grow. Because to be honest, that's the generation that's going to make the change. Um, being in the position that I'm in, you know, working with the guys that we work with, you know, it, it seems that, you know, they're these superheroes, you know, but we've got young kids. We've got 19, 20 year old kids who have the same fears that we all have. Uh, and part of that is, you know, our responsibility to have the conversations with them and try to help them through these times as well. So, you know, I ate it all up and I stored it in my gut, you know, and it's given me fuel to keep pushing uh, and just try to do as much as I possibly can to help, you know, myself understand and then help others try to figure out ways to impact change as well. Thanks, Coach. So, so, Archie, when you and I first met, it was about a year ago, I will tell you that what touched me and really created a, an affinity that I had towards you is that we were in a public forum and you openly just began to talk about your challenges and how, kind of what you've been dealing with over a number of years from a mental health standpoint. I think it would be a gift to our audience if you could just share your story so that the audience can connect with kind of what, it, what, it, what the realities are of dealing with challenges of mental health. Thank you for that, Kevin. Um, so basically what, how my mental health journey began, uh, I would say it began shortly after I graduated from grad school. Uh, I went to New York University to uh, study music business. And after that, I ended up coming home because I couldn't find a job. Uh, so I was living with my parents, didn't have any money, had recently just broken off a, an engagement to a woman I was with for uh, almost five years. So it was really a low point. Finally got back on my feet, got a job. Uh, and at some point, uh, close to Thanksgiving, uh, a couple of friends of mine, fraternity brothers of mine had invited me to 
the fraternity house uh, to basically catch up, uh, have a couple drinks and laughs, and then go home. So I went to the frat house, and um, as I always tell the story, uh, I'd always do it in Kendrick Lamar, pull up, drink, headshot, drink, sit down, drink. I was drinking that night. Um, so much so, in fact, that I really was not in the position to drive home, but I did decide to drive home. While well, I was subsequently pulled over, uh, arrested, and later on indicted for a DUI, which I, um, I ended up uh, getting on my record. And at that time, uh, I could only, because my license was suspended for a year, I could only drive to and from home, work, and church. Uh, and it was at this time that I was truly confronted with the condition that I had been living with for most of my life and didn't know. I had been living with depression for most of my life. Um, but at this time, when I was confronted with my feelings of anxiety, my questioning why am I here, my suicidal ideations, conversations with God, the drinking, the smoking, all these toxic behavior those long days in bed where I couldn't even answer the phone, even if it was right next to me. That weight, that depression was in full steam. It was a year later, Thanksgiving 2014, uh, I had dinner with my family like I've been doing since I grew up. Uh, and it was at that point after dinner, I started noticing I was getting a little claustrophobic. I needed to be alone. My heart was racing, my breath was short. I realized later on that I was having a panic attack, an anxiety attack amongst my own family. And so it was with the nudging of another fraternity brother of mine who was a licensed practitioner who suggested that I should talk to a therapist or talk to someone, a practitioner about what's going on, what I've been going through. The power of the fact that the person that referred me to mental health looked like me was so powerful. Had he not been a black male, I may not have been as compelled to give it a try. I went on to therapy where I was clinically diagnosed with depression. Uh, and over time, over the last six years that I've been going, I've developed um, strength empowering through and managing my depression with coping mechanisms, whether it's the breathing exercises, such as the one we started with, meditation, exercise, eating healthy, all these different things, and also creating my art. Uh, and it was actually on the night of um, the decision uh, to acquit all of the uh, cops involved in Mike Brown slaying that uh, I, I started working on this album the Black Pharaoh EP. And one of the songs that I wrote was this song called Layers, uh, which was a song about my own bouts with depression, but how therapy saved my life. And at that time, there weren't a lot of rappers that were talking about therapy specifically. We all know since the beginning, hip hop has always talked about depression. We've always talked about sexing in a way, we've always talked about boozing in a way, smoking in a way, whatever it is. But to actually explicitly talk about going to a therapist, talking about my problems in order to heal is something that wasn't very common back then. And so I wrote the song Layers, uh, premiered it uh, with an interview I did with Vice that same year. The song went viral. And that was when I realized how powerful this was to speak from a Black male perspective on the importance of mental health explicitly and in a real way not with self-medication. Um, and so I decided to start my organization, Peel Them Layers Back in winter of 2016. Uh, and we've been going ever since. Um, I'm happy to report that we've done, we've made history this last September. Uh, I, we helped to organize with partnership with Lexington Bell Community Center and the Cleveland Orchestra. We produced a program called My Violin Ways a Ton, working with the youth at Lexington Bell Center, teaching them about songwriting, teaching them how to play instruments in efforts to address areas of social anxiety, parental engagement, acts of kindness. And at the end of this program, we did a culminating concert, a hip hop classical music concert at Severance Hall, the first to ever take place at that building, that world renowned building. Um, and we also did a uh, mental health awareness uh, webinar, virtual experience. 
uh, where we had practitioners, we had performers, um, all speaking about mental health in the various ways. Uh, we do open mics, let that ish go, open mic for healing where anyone, any walk, doesn't have to be a singer, a poet or a rapper, can literally get on a forum just like this and just talk. And one of my difficulties since starting P PDLB has been really getting our black men to open up in real ways. It's something that I personally, it's a God-given gift. I'm a sharer. I'm able to share how I feel. And through that, I'm able to get other people to open up. But it's that reason is why I'm here and part of this panel. It's very important that we as black men express how we feel. It doesn't make so, you weak. So, so, so Archie, let me pivot there because that is sure. a perfect point. So thank you for sharing your story. As I said, I, my affinity towards you was the first time I hit I heard your story. And, and Jeff, I recall the conversation that you and I had, I think it was over dinner, maybe the first time we met, and just your passion for Black men and creating opportunities for us to better ourselves, to empower ourselves, was, I know a lot of why you had created Men Thrive. So as, as, I'm, as I'm hearing kind of Archie's story and just knowing kind of your connection to Black men and also behavioral health, can you just kind of share with our audience as to why this is such a big part of who you are and why you are passionate about making sure that the men in your program have an opportunity to express themselves and, and, and be supported with behavioral health experts? No, with, without question. I mean, I, 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 some of you know me as a content creator. I'm, I've had a, a number of, of shows on BET and, and been on syndicated radio, whether Tom Joyner or Ricky Smiley for the last 12 years. And in trying to push to do some of my own content, I wanted to make sure, because that content was, was really focused around elevating the complexity of men. Um, that was what Man Cave was, our last show, and, and a number of, 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 of other content um, plays that I had been involved in. And I wanted to make sure that I had some clinical consultants that would ensure that whether we were doing scripted content or whether we were doing reality content, that we weren't accidentally negatively portraying black men. Um, and that even if we were dealing with accountability, we weren't doing it in a way that we were chipping away at the already fragile kind of identity of black men. And that was what led me to Henry Health, the organization that, um, that Tony is a part of and that now I am a part of, and you gotta excuse me, I got babies and they like coming to the basement door uh, cause they know I'm here. So if you hear them, know I'm a daddy. Um, so so it, it was, it, it, it ultimately became this kind of marriage because as a content and culture guy, um, I wanted to figure out a way to engage men with Henry Health in a way that went beyond the clinical. And we recognize that black men have the highest rates of toxic stress, of anxiety, of, of, of as Argy talked about, depression. But black men also have the lowest life expectancy of any demographic in the United States of America. And so, so like to, to, to say this really quickly, Kev, we, we, all these people are talking about white supremacy, but not talking about white supremacy. Because if you wanna talk about white supremacy, then you have to deal with the reality that slavery was the largest transition of wealth in the history of the world. So it was the economy of the world, of, 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 of the civilized world, slavery was the economy that drove America being a world power in half the time that it took the rest of Europe to become a world power. And so when that happens, Kev, in order to have legal slavery for over 380 some years, you gotta have a narrative of dehumanization because even the most ignorant human that recognizes the benefits of slavery will still ultimately see their nanny as a human or their nanny's child as a human. So white supremacists created a scientific narrative about our lack of humanity. They created a cultural narrative about our lack of humanity. If we talk about Hollywood and the first movie that was ever made was Birth of a Nation, which was a commercial for the Ku Klux Klan that essentially said that black men, all they are is sectional ravenous beasts that only have their thirst quenched by the sex of white women. And we've got to protect the hillsides of America 
from the ravenous beast in black men. That was the first movie ever made in Hollywood. And so the very foundation of Hollywood is on a narrative of our lack of humanity. Couple that with us beginning to believe it. So Archie talked about the fact that we wear the mask and black men talk about code switching as if that joint is good. So we have a value proposition in the fact that I can roll through the hood, I can roll through the suburbs, I can roll into corporate America, I can roll into a business meeting, I can talk to youngins on the block. White men don't ever think about having to change who the hell they are to show up anywhere. And we have actually had to make it a value proposition because there's so many places that our humanity, our very blackness is a threat to everybody else that's there. So we reduce it. I grew up in Cleveland and my dad was part of the whole middle management um, corporate America piece that, that created what some of these black CEOs are now. And, and me and my boys used to have a joke where we would say, you could tell the brothers who have been in corporate America the longest by how little facial hair they have and how little bass they have left in their voice. Because black men consistently shaved their beards and their goatees and their mustache and lowered the base in their voice to not seem as threatening to in many cases, white men and sometimes white women direct reports. And so this, this was slavery at its highest level. And so we, we talk about wearing the mask and, and, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote, um, we wear the mask. And I just think it's, it's profoundly relevant where he said, we wear the mask that grins and lies, we wear the mask that grins and lies that hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. The debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts we smile. A mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh great Christ our cries. To thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile, but let the world dream otherwise, we wear the mask. And the point there, Kev, is that black men have embraced their own inhumanity. When we say to each other that being a man is being unemotional, where I don't cry, where I don't feel pain, where I don't feel hurt. And so nobody can get to me. I can't be no mark. I can't be a mark in the hood that I come from. I can't be a mark in a relationship. I can't be a mark with white folks. But what's so pervasive is that we don't even let ourselves smile because we think we're too goofy if we're overjoyed. We can't show up like little with little kid curiosity because we gotta act like we've been there before. And so we actually promote our own inhumanity through the value proposition of what we've called being a man and reduce our own humanity. And so what this is about for me is how do we show up whole by saying that, listen, just because I acknowledge all my emotion doesn't mean I wear it on my sleeve and I let it control me. Weakness, I don't have weakness in feeling. I have power in feeling because now nobody's able to take any of my humanity away from me. And the fact that I feel pain, I acknowledge pain, I acknowledge hurt. Man, listen, this isn't about what we let the world see. This is about what we let our wives see. This is about what we let our children see. This is about what we let our parents see. This is about what we let our loved ones see. And when our loved ones, our wives, our children, um, our parents can't see the inner reachings of who we actually are, that is not a value proposition, brothers. That's actually weakness. And so right. the, the, the last thing is that, and Tony can speak to this, but traditional treatment is not for black folks because traditional clinicians are trained to treat one single trauma. Most black men and black people are dealing with compounded multiple traumas. So most clinicians aren't even prepared to pull back the layers, right Archie, on who in the hell we are. Also, most clinicians are trained to help people cope and coping is what makes black men feel the weakest. Most therapy does not deal with post-traumatic slave disorder from a position of how do we thrive? And so coping should only be a bridge to thriving. 
if coping is the destination, then most black men, Kev, I had a brother tell me, I'm not going to therapy because I just don't want shit to get worse. I can right. deal with, I just don't want it to get worse. Therapy and getting better is too hard. And so we got to be in a place where we help brothers understand that you don't even understand what thriving feels like because our entire narrative has been about survival. And that is singularly what men thrive is about. Right. So, 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 so Jeff, man, you, you went full cycle, full circle. And I appreciate that because that's the passion that I felt from you when we first met. And I know that's what drives you day in and day out. And, and, and shifting now to coach, because coach, all that Jeff talked about, and particularly just kind of the generational gaps of kind of how African American men are looked at, how we get labeled, even in corporate America, from just our facial hair to how we dress, how we walk. You are a leader of men that has that whole that that that, that whole myriad, if you will, of of the whole spectrum from veterans who have been in the league for a while to 18 and 19 year old men who are coming into the league. And in between you have, you have, you have players from different countries, but yet when this type of, of, of situation happens for black men, how do you deal with that as a leader of your team? And just kind of share with us some insights. And the additional piece is that Kevin Love on our team has been very vocal about mental health and behavioral health and, and having him on the team to provide any insights. Can you just share with the audience, just from your seat, how do you see it? The, the points that Jeff and Archie made, you know, I think are the key is helping people and young men in particular understand the why they're feeling the way that they're feeling. And once we identify the why, then they can start to work you know, to resolve those issues. But we spend so much time and, you know, the guys that we work with, you know, we'll see guys just get upset. They'll just get angry. You know, they'll get frustrated. And, you know, they don't know why they get upset. They don't understand why they're so frustrated. But it's, you know, the things that Jeff and Archie have talked about that have been, you know, put upon us historically that they never understood or haven't been educated to uh, as to the why. So that's where we spend a lot of our time is trying to help kids understand, you know, why they're feeling this way. Uh, and from there, how we can help them uh, thrive, as Jeff was saying. Um, you know, I think working with Kevin has been freeing for a lot of people because, you know, there is a stigma against mental health in our community, uh, you know, being a sign of weakness, having feelings, um, you know, all those things like you can't cry, you can't be hurt. And, you know, in, in our league, it's full of alpha males. It's full of guys who have to be tough, who can't show weakness, you know, who can't let their emotions out because, you know, they're always trying to climb to the top and the numbers just dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. And, you know, emotions and feelings can be taken as a sign of weakness. Uh, but to have a guy like Kevin, who's been to the mountaintop in our sport, you know, he is a, you know, six time all star, I believe he is a world champion. Uh, and for him to come out and, you know, be a tool for other people in our organization uh, to have conversations with him. Uh, and, you know, he does have some tools of coping and, you know, again, giving people the opportunity to ask for the help, I think is huge. Uh, and, you know, that's part of our fight is, you know, nobody wants to admit to it. No one wants to say it's me. No one wants to raise their hand because they are afraid of, you know, growing up being called soft or, you know, crying or, you know, acting like a girl. You know what I mean? Like those are all things that we hear as we grow up. And so now, you know, we put that wall up and we just say, hey, we're going to be the toughest. We're not going to smile. We're not going to cry. You'll never know how I feel. Uh, and so for us, you know, that's the fight is how do we break that down? And, you know, our situation is it's about our team. Right. So how do we help these individuals become the best that they can possibly do in a group environment where we need all 15 guys who are completely different 
to share that, that common space. And if, you know, we've got guys that are holding back and not willing to take that step, like we're not going to be as effective as a team as we need to be. So for the benefit of our individuals and the benefit of our team, like those are the fights that we're fighting and the pushes to get guys to understand that it is okay. You know, it is okay to ask help for your teammate. You know what I mean? If you, if you can't guard a guy, it's okay to ask for help. Uh, and this is kind of, you know, the same thing, obviously on a deeper, a deeper level. So we, we have a couple of uh, questions that have come in, and I also want to encourage any of the listeners, any of the audience, please go ahead and send your questions in via social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, so, Coach, the first question that has come in really is a continuation of what you just talked about. And the question is, what are some of the things that the Cavaliers do? What are the supports that the that an NBA team has behind the scenes to support the, the, the team members, the players, to cope and to deal with the things in which you just referenced? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, our league as a whole has put this in the forefront. So that gives us a leg up before, you know, we even start. Our organization has done the same. Um, but we have, I mean, resources that you can't imagine. You know, we have a team psych, a doctor. We have uh, a director of player programs whose whole responsibility is to help the young kids, you know, adjust to the, you know, the, the new things that they'll be facing in the NBA that can cause them stresses. You know I mean? It's education of the finances, education of, you know, social media presence, you know, all those things. And, and the biggest thing, to be honest with you, Kevin, is there's a support system of people there who help these young men, learn to deal with their families now that they've reached a place of success, right? That's one of the most difficult things that our young men have to go through is, you know, you get to a certain point, you know, so many people have poured a lot of their time into you to help you get to the point that you're at. But now you're looked at as the leader or the anchor of that family and the pressures of, what all your families, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, you know, the pressures of all the things that they need now fall into your lap. And you're the guy who has to make those decisions, you know, to make sure that everyone in the family is okay. And that weighs a ton on, uh, you know, the young men that we deal with, because there is that sense of guilt if you don't help everyone. But, you know, at the same time, understanding how you have to take care of yourself and be strong enough within yourself, and then you can help the others that you know have helped you along the way. So, uh, I mean, the resources are, you know, in different organizations. You know, they look different. They are, you know, certain people work better with certain other people. You know, so we've got all those resources where um, you know they can have conversations with people, but you know, taking steps before they even ask to help them be prepared. For the circumstances that are coming. Yeah, thanks, Coach. Dr. Span, you've joined us again, and as we wind down to uh, the the Q and A, there are a couple questions that I'd like to direct to to you, if we can get your input. And one of the questions that have come up is, what steps do you take to have a black male open up about mental health issues, mental health challenges? And I'll have Dr. Spann kind of begin the, the answer to that. And either Archie or Jeff or Coach, if you want to add to that. Yeah, it's a good question. I get this question a lot. Um, what I generally tell people is that you have to be careful about the language that you're using. A lot of times we'll go into what is considered more clinical language that I may say. I may say more about mental health or I may say, you know, diagnosis. But I generally say if you're having a conversation just with somebody that's a family, a loved one, you know, you can start with maybe just saying mental wellness or just talking about your wellness or how are you doing? Or are you doing all right, brother? I think some of the language that we use can be jarring for people because they're not used to it. And it actually has some triggers for a lot of our communities. Uh, the other thing is stay on the fringes. You don't have to jump into a very deep conversation just yet about mental health or wellness or trauma or what's going on. I find when I stay on the fringes with most of the black men that I work with, and then I get into the center, they realize that, hey, like this is a space that I can be courageous, I can have a great conversation, and I can be me. But when I go right into something where I feel like it, it causes them to trigger, it causes a defense. 
So I think if you're really trying to open up some conversations, start on the fringes, really talk about wellness, how you're feeling today on a scale from one to 10, you know, where you're at with that and open up some conversations that are going to be true to themselves. Okay. Thank you. So I want, I want to go to Archie with this next question and Archie, you have been so courageous in sharing your story and opening up, still following up on the opening up concept. What recommendation can you give our audiences listening as to how to, how to open up, how to say I need help, how to be courageous to say that? If you could offer just a couple of words around that, please. Sure, it's a great question. Uh, first time I've ever been asked that actually. Um, I would, I would recommend uh, to anyone that's watching uh, that knows that they're going through something, uh, first of all, that you're not alone. That's the first and most major thing that I can tell you is that although this depression, this anxiety, uh, whatever, if it's bipolar disorder, whatever it is that you are going through, you are not the only, you're not the first, you are not the last. Uh, mental illness is as common as the cold. Um, so when you open up and share with someone how you feel, it's not just a courageous thing. Like that was the thing, like a lot of people said what I was doing, sharing how I felt was courageous. It feels so good to say it out loud. You have all these thoughts that are bogging you down, that are weighing you down. And all you want to do is just get it out and just say it. And so when someone asks me uh, along the lines of what Dr. Span was talking about, how I'm doing, it's, it's hard for me to, to lie and say like, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm all right. I tell them the real like, yo, it's one of them days, bro. I'm having one of them days. Or I'm great, I'm, man, I'm, I'm killing it at work, I'm doing these things. I keep it real 100% of the time. And there's other things that, you know, my wife, my friends, they know if I'm in a depressive state, if I'm having a depressive episode, a lot of times I just want to be around just to feel their energy. So I may talk, I may not say anything, but being around and having human interaction is something that helps. But I, I would say to answer that question is don't be afraid because the other thing about it is not only are you going to help yourself heal when you share how you feel, when you get connected to those resources, you may be helping someone else just as much as you're helping yourself with sharing how you feel. Yeah, Archie, thank you. So, so gentlemen, we have roughly about two minutes left and I wanna honor our audience uh, commitment to participate with us. So I'm gonna go around and ask you to take you know, 15, 20, 25 seconds to offer any final comments that you can to the audience. If you can just leave one tip, one word of advice relative to this subject that we've been talking about. So Jeff, let me start with you, please. Yeah, uh, brothers, be what you wanna see. Uh, I think we, we often have this issue where we'll have boys that would kill for us, but won't talk to us honestly. And brothers that we'll die for, but we won't tell them what we're most embarrassed about. And so it's not about being in a group therapy session from jump. <laughs> it's who's the one person that you can feel confident admitting to something that you're ashamed of and watching how they don't trip because it's not about being diagnosed with bipolar or clinical depression. It's about the fact that we all just ain't okay. And we all just ain't okay because it's Wednesday, not, be, not necessarily because there's a clinical diagnosis. So before we get to that, just recognize that we all got stuff every day. Um, so, you know, embrace um, self-mastery and therapy. Um, and especially for those of us that are, are Christian, um, don't let that block you. Cause, cause I, I recognize, I appreciate my pastor for the covering and I appreciate my therapist for God allowing them to get through school uh, to help me with my brain science. <laughs> and I need both on different days at different times. Uh, so Hit Men Thrive, um, we have a whole range of meditations and a podcast and connection to uh, therapy through Henry Health. 
Uh, so, so brother Kevin, thank you, man. Thank you for the invitation and the time. I so appreciate it. Uh, Jeff, always, bro. Always appreciate what you bring. Coach, if you could, a closing comment for our audience. Uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's okay to feel the way that you feel. Um, you know, not a lot of times, you know, it's like we feel shame for having those feelings, but it's okay. And the people who love you and the people who are with you, you know, no matter what you're feeling, they're going to understand and they're going to be there to support you and help you. Uh, even if it may be a difficult conversation to initiate, the sooner you get it off your chest, you know, the sooner they're able to be there to support you and you don't have to do it by yourself, uh, it will be easier. So, you know, it's okay that we're not perfect. It's okay that we do have bad days. Um, but, you know, how we respond and we share that information with the people that we love will help us get through those times uh, much easier. Thanks, Coach. Bro Brother Green. Brother Archie. All, all I really want to say is, uh, first of all, uh, remember to limit the amount of this news, this toxic, these images of black bodies uh, being killed. Um, and just being on social media right now, limit that. Um, you know, instead go for a walk, watch a good movie, listen to some music. I mean, I've been bumping All Right by Kendrick like every other day. I also been playing that new Freddie Gibbs, Scotty Bean, Revolution is a Genocide. Like getting into, getting in touch with the art. Um, and again, I would echo what I stated earlier. Remember who you are, brothers. Remember who you are. You are a king, king first. And to my sisters watching, you are a queen first. And that's all men, all women. We talking to the trans community as well. Everybody. Um, you can learn more about Peel Them Layers back at pdlb.org. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. I'm grateful again, Kevin, to the opportunity to, to, to be on this platform with the Cavs. Another thank you to Daniel Sidnor and the NAACP Cleveland chapter as well. Thank you. Dr. Spann? Yeah, on a closing note, I'd like to say, I'd hope that we can continue to have some culture shifting on how we see uh, mental wellness within the black community. Um, mental wellness in any community, particularly in the black community is a form of social justice. If we think about having a mind, body and soul that is healthy generationally, if we can push that into the next generation, that is a way of making sure that we preserve culture and making sure that we stand up in spaces that they never thought we'd be in. So continue to take care of your mind, body and soul that helps us to continue to push forward as a culture. Yeah. So gentlemen, I am honored to listen to this conversation, be a part of it. I, mean, I have so much respect for all four of you and I have learned something myself and Dr. Spann, I, I'm going to shift my, my conversation and my dialogue. It's no longer mental health. It's not behavioral health. It's mental wellness. And I appreciate you sharing that nugget because language is important. Language is important. So my, my closing comments, and I'll answer the question that I want to leave the audience with, is around my plea to our sisters. I am a father of four daughters. And, 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 and Archie, they are all queens. And... I'm going to implore, I'm going to reach out and ask our sisters, if you see us struggling, if you see us being challenged, it's, ask us, take care of us, because you know us better than anybody else, particularly our, brother, our sisters, our wives, our daughters. We need you as much as we need each other in this struggle. So on behalf of the NAACP, the Cleveland Cavaliers, this is the first of many conversations in our All for Black Cleveland series in which we're going to continue to live stream to have these community conversations. We will have conversations that will focus on black women. We'll have conversations on the black family. We'll have conversations talking about economic empowerment. This is our way of bringing the conversation to the community. We thank you. We thank all of you who have listened and I thank our panelists. 